Zagan, an ominous sorcerer, is dreaded by the masses. He is both socially inept and foul-mouthed, occupying himself with the study of sorcery, whilst victing any unwanted visitors from his territory. Upon being invited to attend a clandestine auction, he stumbled upon Nephi, an exceptionally beautiful elven slave girl. At first sight, Zagan experiences love and subsequently spends his entire fortune to acquire her. However, being unable to communicate his affections, and with Nephi lacking important knowledge on how to win over her new master, the two struggled awkwardly to share a living space. The story begins, in the deep, deep forest known as the Lost Woods, a man has taken up residence in a deserted, decaying castle. He is a sorcerer, feared and hated by the populace at large. His name is Zagan, and right now, he is facing a grave challenge. An elf was kneeling in front of him and asked, am I going to be killed? The girl's words shocked Zagan. He wondered, why are you assuming I'm going to kill you? And what exactly am I supposed to do? How do you talk to a girl that you like? Previous morning, a man named Mayers is trying to rape this girl. She finds out he is not Mayers and wonders who this man is. He used a knife to tear her dress and said, that's a pretty tasty face you're making there. And I hate to disappoint you, but this isn't the kind of assault you are hoping for. See, the face off a living virgin makes a hell of a catalyst. He wants to take away her face. The girl screamed, and suddenly Zagan stepped forward and lifted the man up with one hand. The man realized he was in this sorcerer's territory. He said we are both sorcerers. Let me go and I'll share the fruits of my research with you. Zagan said he doesn't need any sorcery that requires flaying people. He then finished off the man. This made the girl scared and fainted. Zagan was confused and didn't know what to do. She's absolutely going to be traumatized when she wakes up. He uses Rewound Cycle. All that really does is put everything back where it was. But since the blood is gone, she will probably think it was a dream. He sees her wearing a cross and wonders is she with the church. The self-proclaimed apostles of the gods. Enemies of all sorcerers. He actually saved her, but he is likely to get blamed for the attack. If he drops her on the road to a town, someone's bound to find her. However, something's interfering with his translocation sorcery. This is his story. He has received protective fields all around. This isn't a trick that just any sorcerer can pull. A man named Barbados appeared. It seemed like they knew each other before. Barbados asked Zagan what he was doing. Zagan said that he is just teaching a lesson to a creep who was making a fuss in his yard. Barbados sees what Zagan is doing as a waste of time. We are sorcerers. The only thing we respect is our own pursuit of power. Other people's lives and livelihoods are nothing but fuel for that, which we take if we feel like it. That's what it means to be a sorcerer, right? This girl's got a decent amount of mana. He asked Zagan, are you going to sacrifice her or something? Zagan said that sacrificial sorcery isn't his style. He used teleportation magic to bring her closer to the human town. Barbados says what a waste. You should have let me have her if you weren't going to use her. Zagan wanted to go to bed because he was up late reading sorceress tomes. He told Barbados to come back later if he needed something. Barbados still followed Zagan and said you could always just tweak your brain with adrenaline to wake up. Zagan said that sort of thing is how you ended up looking like such a mess yourself. Barbados believes that manipulating the body is fundamental for sorcery. It keeps us healthy and long-lived even if it's got a limit of about a thousand years. I've got some real interesting news, Zagan. Did you know one of the archdemons, Marchojas, is dead? Zagan explains that the archdemons, earning that title gets you an incredible amount of mana, along with the authority to command lower-ranked sorcerers. They are the pinnacle of sorcery. Of the thirteen archdemons, the longest lived, who had been around for a millennium, passed away the other day. Barbados said that there's apparently going to be a huge auction at Marchoja's territory, Kyanoids, from legitimate merchandise to the kind of thing you and I would be interested in. An archdemon's legacy is going to be up for auction. They then go together to a city where the auction will take place. Zagan said I thought you actually had news for me, but you just want to borrow money for the auction, don't you? I could just buy the legacy for myself, you know. This shocked Barbados, as he found it unfair since he was the one who told Zagan this news. However, Zagan still refused to lend money to Barbados. Barbados continued to beg Zagan to borrow money and promise to help him pick out some nice chicks in exchange. But Zagan didn't care. Zagan found that the guards seemed weirdly on edge. Barbados said that that'd be due to the serial kidnappings. Some dumbasses have been snatching up young women for sorceress experiments. Zagan thinks they're basically picking a fight with the church. Maybe they're planning on summoning something significant. Like an actual demon. That's like something out of a fairy tale. They then moved into the secret basement, where the auction took place. Barbados said, check it out, Zagan. 
we've got a regular bunch of celebrities. Kimaris, the Black Blade. Gramary, the Enchantress. And there's even Vale for the apparition. Zagan asked, are they strong? Barbados explains that they're candidates to become the 13th Archdemon now that old Marchojas is gone. Gramary told Kimaris, look over there. The sickly looking guy who's loafing around. What was his name again? Kimaris believes that is Barbados the Purgatory, and that sour looking one next to him is called Zagan. He's young, and without a title, but for some reason his name came up among the Archdemon candidates. The host announced that, who has finally come to our final, and most remarkable lot for the auction. This merchandise was previously scheduled to come into the possession of Archdemon Marchojas himself. However, with Lord Marchojas passing, that deal fell through, and it is now on us to see that it finds a new owner, a member of the legendary race from the distant Norden Holy Land. An elf. Suddenly, Zagan felt nervous and excited. The host continues to introduce this elf, as you're all aware, elves are closer to gods and nature spirits than humans. And as you can see with this one, she has striking white hair. This isn't dyed, folks. You're looking at an extremely rare, naturally platinum locked elf. Her magical properties make her extremely valuable, to say nothing of her worth as a love slave. And if you can afford the price, she's yours for doing as you please. Let's start the bidding at 10,000. Zagan shouted, 1 million, shocking all the guests around. Barbados was also startled. Zagan shouted loudly again, 1 million gold curiotes. The host announced that this elf belonged to Zagan. Barbados felt Zagan was a waste of money on an elf. Zagan wondered, what is this feeling in my chest? She's so lovely. Is that the right way to express it? I want to help her, I want to see her smiling. And I want to touch her. It's like I've finally found something I didn't know I was looking for. Barbados asked, what the hell kind of sorcery are you going to use her for? Zagan replied with a scary expression. Zagan flew to the elf and didn't know what to say to her. He asked what this chain was. The host explains that the collar must keep her mana contained. She's likely to run off without it, so please, be careful. That said, none of us know how to remove it, anyway. Zagan asked, is she conscious? The host told him not to worry. She's been preserved in her natural state, sir. To be honest, she's got such incredible capacity, ordinary sorcery hasn't proven effective. First, Zagan liked to talk to her. He can't wait to hear the sweet sounds she makes. This makes people think he is a sadist. This is what happens when someone who thought women were too much trouble just moments ago falls in love for the first time in his life. Well, he's brought her home, but he should have asked Barbados about this. He wonders what am I supposed to say to her. But I have to say something eventually. He planned to say, the sky is beautiful today but hesitates because she can't see the sky in here and the weather is awful. The girl asked him, Master, is it alright if I ask a question? Zagan was delighted to hear her voice. She's got a sweet voice, like the ringing of a bell. She asked, am I going to be killed? After hearing this, Zagan was shocked and explained that I'm not going to kill you. If anything, I need you alive. The girl said I should be expecting something worse than death with no release, and looked towards a coffin. Zagan wants to say you've got it wrong. All this stuff belongs to the castle's previous owner. I just never got rid of it because it seemed like a lot of work. He sat down and introduced himself as Zagan. As you can tell, I'm a sorcerer, but I have no interest in torture. She introduced her name as Nephilia. If you find it distasteful, please, just call me Nephi. Zagan was very excited. Not only is her name beautiful, she's got a cute nickname like Nephi. He asked, is it common for elves not to have a family name? She said no, I just happen to be a cursed child. You don't need to worry. I'm a virgin. Her actions confused Zagan. She thought he was concerned about her value as a subject for his experiments. Zagan says don't misunderstand me. I have no intention of experimenting on you. She asked, why did you buy me, then? Zagan replied, you don't need to know that. He cursed himself, what am I even saying? But I fell head over heels for you at an underground auction and spent my entire fortune buying you obviously makes me sound like some kind of pervert. And if we're going to be living together in the future, I couldn't bear her looking at me like that. I need to calm down. I'm a witcher. A powerful sorcerer should always maintain his composure. Nephi, for now, I'm going to provide you with a room. Pick out whichever you would like. She asked, are you asking me to choose where I'll die? Zagan said, I told you, I'm not going to kill you. She wondered, are you saying that I'm not going to be killed, no matter what purpose you have for me? Zagan realized that she was caught and sold off as a slave. She was probably told that she was going to be a test subject or a sacrifice this entire time. He doesn't know what this is cursed child business is, and she doesn't seem to want to talk about it, so she probably doesn't have a home to return to. It was the same for him. 
Not only did he not have a family name, he doesn't even remember his parents. The first thing he does remember is living in the trash and being called by the name Zakin. He says, I bought you because I need you. This surprised Nephi. Now, about your room. What would be good? Maybe someplace with a view. He asked, do you mind heights? She said, no, feel free to hang me by the neck or the wrists as you like. Zagan says, I'm not talking about torture. He continued to take her to choose a room. She slipped and was caught by his hand. He told her to be careful and felt extremely nervous as he held her hand. They're so soft and warm. He said that this room isn't usually in use. It might not be very tidy. But he immediately closed the door when he saw a beheading machine there. The girl said you may take my head as it pleases you, master. He explains that it's a trap to protect the castle from airborne enemies. However, I can see how it'd be in the way. Let me dispose of it. He burned all the furniture inside the room. At least now she won't find it scary anymore. She entered the room and looked at the moon. Looks like she really liked it. It was on this night that their long cohabitation and their very, very long story began. The next morning, Zagan didn't get a wink of sleep. That room was in no state for it, so he had her sleeping in here, but seeing her look so helpless, it'd be impossible for his imagination not to run wild. Not that he has the guts to actually try something. The thought of upsetting her makes that out of the question. He felt hungry and looked for something to eat. She woke up and said good morning to Zagan. Zagan wondered what are you supposed to say when someone says good morning. Just say good morning back. Hello there. Good day to you is probably a bit much. He decided to say, I brought food. You may eat. He blames himself, he can't even give a proper greeting. He wondered, when did I become such a failure of a person? Probably right from the start. The girl asked, Master, are you eating the same thing as me? I'm lucky to be fed at all. But it's strange that you're eating the same thing. He realizes the food is plain. She said, it's the kind of thing that would be typically fed to a slave like herself. Or to put it another way, it's something for pigs to eat. He sees that she seems more worried than angry. He guesses this barely even qualifies as food. He's eaten stuff like this his whole life, so he's never questioned it. Other than jerky, there's also moldy bread. He wonders what normal people eat. Hearing that, Nephi asked him for permission to prepare something. Zagan was surprised that Nephi could cook. His dedication to sorcery has kept him from even considering the possibility. And now the girl he's in love with is going to cook for him. Nephi, it seems our task is clear. We're going grocery shopping in town. The carriage driver said they needed three bronze pieces to get to town. Zagan remembered that he had no money. He used all his money to buy Nephi at auction. He said, walking every now and then isn't so bad. He needs to shore up his finances somehow. He doesn't have a single bronze coin left at the castle. He might be able to sell the torture equipment that's leaving there, but he doesn't have the money to hire someone to pack it up. He thought about killing the coachman and stealing the vehicle but he had a feeling Nephi would be very angry if he did that. Suddenly, he heard the screams of the coachman and a passenger. Zagan sees that they are not sorcerers or anything, just a band of harmless robbers. He saw Nephi looking scared and thought she was kidnapped, too. He immediately used thunder magic to scare them. The robbers were surprised when a sorcerer appeared. The leader says that the sorcerers need to rest before casting another spell. Get him before he does. Nephi, stay behind me. I'm not going to say anything as self-serving as I'm going to protect you. But I'll demonstrate that you have nothing to fear from them. He blocked the robber's axe with his bare hands. He crushed the axe and used the snap of his fingers to defeat the bald man. One of them shouted to call someone. A sorcerer appears and wonders. A sorcerer helping others? What an odd sight. Zagan finds that they have hired a sorcerer to protect them. The sorcerer says I don't know who you are, but you'll regret crossing my path. He uses the flames to trace another casting circle. Zagan realized that and extinguished the fire. The sorcerer said it was too late. He had finished drawing the magic circle and activated the spell but failed. Zagan's usurped control of the sorcerer's casting circle. It no longer belongs to him. He threatened the robbers. If you are willing to steal from others, you must be ready to be stolen from. His expression frightened them and they ran away. He then said a few words to reassure Nephi. Now, as you can see, Nephi, robbers like that are as harmless as dust. Brush them aside, and they'll settle down. The passengers rejoiced and thanked Zagan for saving them. They guess there are good sorcerers, too. The coachman gave Zagan a bag of silver coins to repay the favor. Zagan wondered, does money really come along this easily? If he goes around running off bad guys, people will just pay him for it. Sorcerers are usually the bad guys who are being hunted. Still, he's scattered his fair share of annoying robbers, but he's never been tuned in for it before. They also thanked Nephi and found her to have a great master. Zagan and Nephi are then taken to town for free by the coachman. 
Nephi asked, why did you save these people? Zagan replied that, I guess that was an unintended consequence. But actually, he just wanted to show that she had nothing to fear from those robbers. He realized, maybe this is his chance to catch her eye. If he can say something smooth, that'll take her to open up. For example, I did it to protect you, Nephi. I can't abandon the weak when they're in need. All I did was teach some self-important filth their place in the world. That's what he thought. When arriving in town, first let's take care of any daily necessities Nephi might need. What exactly does a girl need, anyway? He told Nephi to pick out whatever she needs. She said she'll be satisfied with any old thing he might have laying around. Zagan thinks a girl who doubts her own survival probably doesn't have much in the way of material wants. Seeing her move awkwardly in the dress, he wanted to choose simpler clothes for her. The seller was scared when she saw a sorcerer visiting her shop. She's clearly not happy to see him. He told the seller to put together some kind of outfit for Nephi. The seller finds Nephi so beautiful but feels sad that she is wearing a slave collar. Zagan also realized that collar really does attract attention. The seller chose an outfit that made them both blush. The seller says, what do you think? I don't mind saying I think it's perfect. I was trying to cater to your tastes, sir. Zagan wondered, who exactly does she think I am? He asked the seller to choose some normal clothes for her. In that case, let's try the next one. Now, what do you think of this one? It's an orthodox made outfit, but the dress and apron are both made of high quality silk. The boots have healing sorcery applied to them, which limits the amount of exhaustion caused from working on your feet. This seems like a suitable outfit for her, and she loves it too. Not long after they left the store, the seller told Nephi that it's great that you have a master who cares for you. This made Nephi a bit shaken. Next, they stopped by a weapon forging shop. He asked the blacksmith if there was any way to remove that collar. This surprised Nephi. Zagan explains that as long as you wear it, it's like you're still Archdemon Marchoja's property. You don't need it anymore. The blacksmith says this thing's ensorcelled. That's too much for folks like us. And I hate to break it to you, but I'm pretty sure the collar's trapped. If you don't remove it the right way, it might take her head off. That rules out removing it by force. Using the original key would be best. No one at the auction had a key. It's likely somewhere inside of Marchoja's castle. Zagan thanked the blacksmith for his advice and sent him a few silver coins. The blacksmith said that I haven't done anything to earn that. Not to mention, I couldn't accept payment from you. You saved me once before. It was about a year ago. When my coach was under attack, you saved my daughter and me. We ran off because we were scared, but you were nice enough to let us go. I hope you can forgive us. Out of the millions of pests Zagan swatted, some of them must have been attacking this blacksmith. Zagan says I'll take this back, then. But you don't need to worry about that meaningless act. I don't even remember it. The blacksmith said, I'll never forget. If you ever need anything, by all means, let me know. Zagan feels strange today. People are being so friendly. It's creeping him out. He wondered, having Nephi around makes this big a difference. The blacksmith remembered that Zango was too scary to even speak before. But look at him now. He has changed. The sun's already set. Zanga thinks he shouldn't make Nephi cook after getting home so late. He took her to a restaurant for dinner. She asked, Master, do you intend to remove this collar? Do you not think I'll run away once it's gone? Zagan thinks well, the idea doesn't thrill him. And it's pretty likely to happen. Nephi has no reason to be invested in him as he is in her. But even then, even if it means she might run. He replied, it's not as if I can take it off right now, anyway. I wouldn't get your hopes up. Immediately, he blamed himself, why couldn't I just say, but I still want to take it off you. Seeing that Nephi still hadn't eaten, he asked, what's wrong? Do you don't know how to use a knife and fork? She said I'd just never eaten like this before. Zagan thinks he finally understands what it is about Nephi that grabbed his attention at a glance. They're the same. She's just like he was when he had no power, despairing at a world where he didn't belong. He told Nephi, just start with whatever you think looks best. There's no one here you need to show restraint for. Just eat. It should be much better than the jerky from this morning. However, it seems like she really doesn't know how to use a fork. It was the first time she ate food from outside and felt it was delicious. However, it seems like Zagan also doesn't know how to use a fork. He tried again, and it was still the same. Nephi used a spoon to feed him. This action made them both blush. Nephi asked you never gave me any orders, master. Will you allow me to do things that I think will be of use to you? Zagan replied that I would. Do as you wish, Nephi. You like these, right? Go ahead. The two sweet actions were seen by people inside the restaurant, making them extremely embarrassed. For now, it seems seeing each other as master and servant has helped things settle down. The girl from the church who was saved by Zagan before was thinking that was no dream. 
Unbelievably, a sorcerer saved my life. We've been exterminating wicked witchers who target young women, and we're on the way home. One of the angelic knights suddenly attacked us. But later, I learned it was really one of the face stealers, the very group we'd been after. And that man, his name is Zagan. He had a very cruel look at him. But something about him seemed lonely, too. Lord Clavwell enters and tells her there's no need for such formalities. You're the hero responsible for getting rid of the sinners behind this string of kidnappings. That's not your fault. And you returned after avenging your brothers. You can be proud of that deed. But this incident is not over yet. After scouring the sorcerer's lair, we've discovered another. The culprit is behind it all. The sorcerer, Zagan. He's the one truly responsible for these horrid kidnappings. The girl thought this was a mistake. Lord Clavwell says that sorcerers are wicked. Even if he has no connection to these kidnappings, he is still evil and must face judgment. She wants to join this duty. He's pleased that she would volunteer. He left it to her then, maiden of the sacred sword, angelic knight captain, Chastel Lilkvist. 